Well, hello everybody. Welcome to Byron Community Church. Thank you for joining us here on YouTube today. Now we're gonna do things a little bit differently today as we're gonna hold off and do our announcements and things after the sermon. And following the sermon, uh, there's gonna be a time where we're going to acknowledge the tragic events from last weekend. But first we wanna turn things over to Pastor John for the sermon this morning, which is entitled, Busy Bodies, Troublemakers, or Godly People in Conflict. Over to you, John. Well, as you can tell, I'm still having to wear my eye patch. I do appreciate your thoughts and prayers. Uh, someone even has given me a pirate's wig uh, to wear at the start this morning. And I even like the pirate riddles and jokes that a few of you have sent me. Like, um, what is a pirate's favorite letter? Arr. Uh, what is a pirate's favorite fast food restaurant? Arvies. Um, who does the a pastor cheer for when it comes to uh, the CFL? You guessed it. The Toronto Argos. Okay, well, uh, I sure would like you to uh, keep praying for me. I've got some eye tests coming up. Uh, I would encourage you to keep sending along your, uh, your uh, pirate riddles and uh, your pirate uh, jokes and even your fact checks. Uh, I appreciate someone who uh, reached out the other day uh, you may recall last weekend, I made reference to Pastor Chuck Swindoll, and I mentioned that he died a few years ago. Well, uh, this person very kindly and graciously informed me that, in fact, Pastor Chuck Swindoll is very much alive and still going strong, preaching into his 80s. So I stand corrected. And uh, Chuck Swindoll, Pastor Chuck, if you are watching this online sermon this morning, um, my sincere apology. And I'm not counting on Chuck Swindoll listening in, but I thought that kind of apology would be appropriate. Well, on another note, recently there's been a lot of of bad news. Like the horrific incident on Hyde Park Road this past Sunday night. A precious Muslim family being robbed of their lives. A young nine-year-old boy robbed of his mom, dad, sister, and grandmother. Our hearts go out to all of those impacted by this senseless tragedy. And then there's the news of that number, 215. 215 representing Indigenous children whose remains have been discovered in crude graves in Kamloops, B.C. Innocent boys and girls, robbed of their dignity and their lives. And then, a few weeks ago, there was disturbing news about a criminal case and then conviction of a woman named Crystal Ogg, uh, a, a woman from Dutton, Ontario. Uh, did you hear about it? It's prison now for this woman who would mine through obituaries. She'd look at them searching for funeral times in order that she could break in to the homes of those mourners attending a funeral service. Mrs. Og, the judge, said, treated obituaries like invitations, 
like opportunities to break in to the homes of those grieving uh, over a deceased loved one. Wearing gloves, a black toque, carrying a hammer, this woman stole um, jewelry, electronic devices, collectibles, and cash. Utterly deplorable. Such robberies ratchet up our sense of disgust, causing us to be discouraged and disheartened. You know, years ago, the Apostle Paul got disturbing news. Likely it came to him through his friend Epaphroditus. Uh, this news uh, involved his good friends, the church at Philippi. Uh, there was a threat that had the potential of robbing this community of believers, stealing their, their joy, the potential of stealing their peace, even their very stability in the Lord Jesus Christ. The uh, potential threat involved a conflict, a disagreement between two women in the church at Philippi. Uh, this threat was endangering the very unity of the church in Philippi. Conflict can do that. Conflict, disputes, disagreements. We see them and can think about them in the workplace. Many of you may work at a place where conflict has created a very toxic environment. Maybe it's a conflict you're aware of between neighbors. What about in your family? I'm, I know of very few families that don't have to deal with conflict at some level. Maybe a conflict between two uh, adult sisters, uh, a conflict between parents and uh, a child. And then, of course, unfortunately, and far too often, there can be conflict in the church. Think of uh, a few scenarios. Uh, you, you've got a mission committee, and the commission, missionary committee have tentatively agreed to support, to send some funds to a church family about to embark on a summer mission trip to South America. But they get news, the mission committee, of an urgent need in Africa. Uh, this is a crisis. And so one of the key members of the mission committee, a uh, facilitator, convinces the other members of the committee to, di to divert the funds that were going to go to the family headed to South America and, and, and to use those funds for this uh, crisis, this special project uh, in Africa. Well, you can imagine, this decision creates uh, a lot of conflict. The young family headed to South America are deeply disappointed, and people in the church pick sides. Uh, it has created quite a mess, quite a falling out. Or take this situation. Uh, there are two couples in the church. For years, they've been very good friends, uh, the one couple have children, including a daughter. Uh, the other couple have children, including a son. And that son and daughter start to date. It seems like a match made in heaven until six months in, the daughter breaks up with the other family son. The family with that son wonders, isn't our son good enough for her? And this breakup causes a, a lot of friction 
tension, even a fractured relationship between these two couples that have been long-term friends. In fact, uh, don't get these two couples together at an event. It will likely spoil the evening. Or how about this scenario? Um, it is a, a, a Zoom meeting, and uh, the facilitator uh, decides to uh, speak out on vaccinations. And he expresses a very strong viewpoint. And during that Zoom meeting, uh, one of the participants objects and puts the facilitator on the defensive. It gets uh, very ugly, this fight going on on the screen. And uh, as you can guess, uh, it creates a falling out between these two men. Uh, a major disagreement, and, and creates tension in the wider church community. Or how about this scenario? Uh, Betty is a manager in a store, and uh, she hires Bonnie, another woman in the church who is out of work, who needs a job, and it, it, it just seems such a, a, a wonderful thing until eight months in. Uh, where uh, the, the, the person just hired gets fired. And there, there's upset. Someone asks, is, is that even allowed? Can one Christian fire another Christian? And it creates a lot of upset. And, and people pick sides in the church. And it's created a major disruption. Oh, maybe one final scenario to cover a lot of bases. Um, you've got, uh, she, she has a husband who uh, has faithfully played the drums on the worship team for years. He's been consistent and very faithful in offering that kind of service and support to the church. Well, along comes a new family into the church. And uh, the husband happens to be a hotshot drummer. And the worship coordinate, coordinator kind of gravitates to this guy, uh, gushes and fawns all over him. And very soon, this first woman's husband is kind of regulated to the sidelines. Oh, he says, that's okay. Uh, this new guy is better than me. But his wife knows that he's hurt. And this situation causes the wife to be angry and upset. No, she determines we're not going to create waves, but we are going to need to leave the church. Conflicts, they're everywhere. And uh, I could give you all kinds of other uh, hypothetical situations. Maybe some of you are going, oh, I can relate to that. I've seen that happen. And we all would agree that conflicts are, are very real. Conflict, disagreements, conflict resolution. That's the theme that we encounter today in this installment of our Philippian series as we begin Philippians chapter 4. You're right, the last chapter in Philippians. We began this series way back, the very first uh, or the second Sunday in January of this year, and now we're kind of in this final lap. But it is a very important chapter in Paul's letter to the Philippians. Um, he will deal with the matter of the financial gift that the Philippians uh, had uh, Epaphroditus deliver to Paul. Uh, we'll see some great teaching and insights on that. But at the beginning of chapter 4, Paul is going to deal with this uh, significant issue of, of conflict and a, a very specific disagreement uh, between two women in the church at Philippi. So I'd like to read for you 
from Philippians chapter 4, and we will read verses 1 through the end of verse 3. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I, whom I love and I long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this area, my dear friends, or literally translated, my beloved. I plead with Eusodia and I plead with Syntyche. Now, I'm going to call these women, I could call them E and S, but for our sake, to keep it easy, I'll call them Emily and Susan. Paul says, I plead with Emily, I plead with Susan to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. Now, there's so many questions that surface in this paragraph at the beginning of Philippians chapter 4. A question like, who were these women? Um, We don't seem to know a lot about them. The only time their names are listed in the Bible. And then we ask the question, uh, what was the nature of the conflict, the nature of the disagreement? We don't seem to have juicy details. Uh, Our curiosity uh, is aroused, but we don't have a lot of information. Um, Maybe this is kind of like Paul's thorn in the flesh that he talks about in 2 Corinthians 12. Uh, Paul knows what it is, and the Corinthians know what it is, but we're kind of left in the dark. It's the same here in Philippians. Uh, I believe that Paul knew the nature of the conflict. Uh, The Philippians would be well aware of what was affecting these women and the wider community. Uh, But for our sake, we are left to speculate. But the good thing is, is we can't kind of pull back and say, well, oh, if if, if that was the nature of the disagreement, uh, that's really not relevant or applies to us. I would argue that any of the scenarios that I've referred to earlier or any kind of conflict you can think of could fit into uh, this kind of... uh, pattern or model that we see in these first three verses of Philippians chapter 4. Another question that that I've had asked of me about this passage, uh, were were these just like uh, bad women uh, or or, or bad girls? Um, I know there's a series of books called, you know, the bad girls of the Old Testament, the bad girls of the New Testament. Um, I even in our title today inferred, uh, were these women uh, busybodies or troublemakers? But may I argue very strongly that these were prominent, respected women. We see that very clearly in Philippians 4, verses 2 and 3. Uh, These women were likely among the first converts who established the church of Christ at Philippi. We think of Lydia, but we think of other women who prayed with her, who heard the gospel, who came to know Christ as Savior and Lord. So these were significant women, uh, godly women, who were disagreeing with each other, uh, were experiencing uh, some kind of conflict. So while we have a lot of mystery with this paragraph, may I propose that there are insights and lessons for us as we deal with conflict anywhere, but especially in the church, and as we look towards conflict resolution. I have uh, three sections in our message today. 
the first section I'm calling general observations. Then we'll get a little more specific as we look at Paul's approach to this situation. And then finally, especially for those of you who like things practical, we're going to look at uh, specific strategies, uh, specific steps that help us in the area of conflict resolution. So this would be a good time to pause because having a pen and paper would be helpful to you. Uh, there will be several points under each section, but we'll move quickly, almost shotgun style, so we can uh, maximize our time effectively. So let's start with what I call general observations. I've got four points under what I call general observations. The first point is this. Good people and good churches can experience conflict. I've already made the case that we're dealing here with two women who were prominent, very respected, very godly women. And the church at Philippi, we've already seen in our series, was a wonderful church. As Paul indicates in verse 1, a church that he uh, loved very much. But even good people can experience conflict. I remember back in seminary, two fellows, and just for uh, the sake of privacy, I will refer to one as R, and I'll refer to the other guy as P. Great guys. I, I don't think they had a lot to do with each other in seminary, but when they graduated seminary, it turns out that R went to work with this church, and P did as well. And I was very excited. I was very delighted because they were great guys. Different personalities, uh, different styles, but two guys who really loved the Lord. And, you know, they went to that church, and things went so well. They worked so well together until about five years in there was a major falling out between these two guys. To this day, I don't even know the specifics of why that happened, but it was a major falling out. And affirms this truth that even good people can experience conflict or disagreement. Hey, let's be clear, Paul himself wasn't immune to conflict. Think of his major disagreement with Barnabas. Was Paul a good guy and Barnabas a bad guy? No. Both were outstanding Christians, real fine godly men. So even good people, good churches, can experience conflict. The second point uh, for a general observation I remember what I read once in a book. Conflict is, period. If you've got people, and we know that people are different, we know that there are different personalities, different preferences, people have different opinions, conflict is inevitable. To me, the better distinction is between what I label healthy conflict and unhealthy conflict. Conflict can be productive. Sometimes through our disagreements that lead to debate, we arrive at some really good decisions. But then there's the kind of conflict that most of us think of when we hear the word conflict, what I label unhealthy conflict. And under this banner, I would make another distinction, and, and that is between um, what I call the, the actual conflict, but looking at the root causes 
behind a conflict and the consequences. So root causes, think of even a couple of the scenarios that we talked about. Uh, While you have that conflict uh, involving missions, uh, to me, a, a root cause might be the understanding of what tentative agreement means. Uh, My sense is that the couple headed to uh, South America had an interpretation of that phrase, tentative agreement, uh, different than uh, the members of the mission committee. Uh, When it comes to that uh, hiring situation, and you remember uh, I suggested some people in the church going, is it even appropriate for a Christian to fire another Christian. Well, that's built on an expectation. And often it's that expectation that's the root cause behind the conflict. Is the expectation uh, realistic or unrealistic? Or what do we do when we're dealing with different sets of expectations? And often when we look at conflict gone bad, we're looking at the consequences, how the conflict is dealt with or uh, how it's uh, being handled or resolved. So conflict is. My, My third point under general observation is what I'm calling the stand firm, uh, stand together principle. So you'll notice in our passage there are two imperatives. At the end of verse 1, Paul tells the Philippians, stand firm. Um, And then into verse 2 and 3, where Paul exhorts the two women, uh, be of the same mind, uh, which is an expression for uh, be united, be in harmony. Stand firm, stand together. Now that phrase, stand firm, may be Paul taking a narrow look back to what he has presented already, uh, for example, in Philippians chapter 3. Stand firm, be steadfast in the teaching I've just provided. Although I do think it's helpful to go all the way back, as I suggested last week, to Philippians 1 verse 27, where you also see Paul telling the Philippians to stand firm. It's an athletic term, meaning to be steadfast, to stand firm, to stand tall, especially in the face of opposition. And even there in chapter 1, Paul suggests that to stand firm in this way requires that we stand together. So may I propose that Here at the end of uh, chapter 4, verse 1, when Paul is staying stand firm, he's setting the Philippians up for this exhortation specifically given to the two women where he is telling them to stand together. I see a link. The way we stand firm in the face of our opposition out there is by standing together together. Uh, The enemy is out there. Now, as I said last week, our goal should be in this spiritual battle to win our enemies over to Jesus Christ. But we always need to remember that we're not enemies when it comes to other members, others who are Christ followers in our Christian community. Stand firm by standing together. As we stand together, we are able to stand firm in the Lord. Hey, I'm standing here in the library. Out these windows is the parking lot where the boys and girls uh, have often been part of our church ball hockey league. Uh, I've witnessed a number of games where you'll have two players on the same team going after the ball, perhaps in the corner. And the coach inevitably will cry out, hey, hey, you're on the same 
team. Don't be fighting with each other. One of you go for the ball, the other be ready for a pass or be ready to contribute in another way. We're on the same team. Don't be fighting each other. And that could even happen in adult sports. I saw a Blue Jay game recently. I know there's a lot of Blue Jay fans. And it was Randall Gertschuk and uh, Marcus Simeon going after the same fly ball. They both called for it. And uh, it, it caused a little disruption between them. But the commentator said they, they need to work that out uh, because they're on the same team. They wear the same uniform. So we stand firm by standing together. And then finally, a final point under general observation is this. Conflict resolution is a priority. What's at stake? Well, in verse 1, Paul talks about joy. Um, Paul infers a, a peace, uh, even our steadfastness or stability uh, in, in Christ can be at stake. So it, it's a high priority. It's very important that especially in the church community, we work towards conflict resolution. Oh, well, conflict resolution is important in the workplace, in, in, in family life. I hope that you'll pick up some helpful insights today but we're especially concerned about the church where maintaining unity always needs to be a priority. Well, let's shift. Let's think a little bit now under our second section, uh, some points regarding Paul's approach to the situation. I want to start by, by looking at Paul's starting point. For in verse 1, we see, Paul's big heart, his love for the Philippians in general, and specifically for these two women. And the lesson I see here is, yes, Paul needs to correct them. There needs to be a rebuke, but for Paul, it's in the context of love. If you noticed in verse 1, where Paul talks about uh, loving his brothers and sisters, he, he goes on, there. you're my joy and my crown. And then, as I said at the end of the verse 1, he reminds them that they are his dear friends, or literally translated, my beloved. This, in verse 1, is a flood of affection. This is an outpouring from Paul's heart. Paul just piles on his sense of emotional attachment to the Philippians. He loves them very much. He's concerned about them. He is compassionate for this church. And it's not that Paul is saying, I love you too much to have to deal with this elephant in the room, this conflict between the two women. I, I, I believe Paul would be saying it's precisely because I love you so much that I don't want to see you robbed of your joy and your peace. I want to see this unity flourish in the church at Philippi. I love you too much not to address it. So there's Paul's big heart, and then there's Paul's specific appeal. Um, what I like about verse 2 as Paul pleads with these two women we're calling Emily and Susan, uh, Paul isn't picking sides. Paul isn't saying, well, Emily, I think that uh, you're more in the right than Susan is. No, uh, Paul is being very fair with these women. He commends them. He praises them. He gives them much credit for their participation and partnership in the spread of the gospel. But Paul expresses his desire that they resolve this conflict and they sh share, especially these two women, share in his concern about the nature of this disruption, uh, about settling this uh, 
disagreement. Did you notice as well, the third point, that Paul names names. Now, the specific names, Eusodia, and uh, I pronounce it Synarchy, um, the, the, the one name means in, in uh, the, the Greco-Roman world, success. The other name means uh, lucky. Well, interesting names, um, but it, it, it also intrigues me that, that, that Paul was very specific. He, he calls them out. I believe strongly he, he's not out to embarrass these women. But he calls them out, and we have to be careful how we apply this to our conflict situations, even in the church. Could, could you imagine if uh, I paused now and I said, uh, okay, I'm going to address you, Bill, and, and you, Bob, who are listening in today. I know that there's a disagreement between the two of you. Uh, you realize it's impacting the church. Uh, some of you would squirm a little bit. You'd maybe even ask how appropriate is that. But Paul and its discernment determined that this kind of calling out their names was necessary and appropriate. Uh, part of me believes they may have, as prominent women, represented a couple of significant factions within the church. So th these women may have, in their disagreement, been representing uh, two different parties in the church that were, were divided. Nevertheless, there are times where uh, someone in a pastoral or leadership role can be specific. But here's what I also wanted you to notice. Paul has this uh, unusual call out to Clement. We don't even know who Clement was, um, why uh, Clement received attention or a little bit of a, a shout-out. Sometimes a pastor will do that. He's preaching and makes reference to this person or that person. Again, maybe representing, in this case, a, a group of co-workers who had been very dedicated and loyal to Paul for the cause and sake of the gospel. But what I want you to know is, is right at the end of verse 3, where Paul talks about co-workers like Clement and these two women and others, whose names are in the book of life. And I think what Paul is saying here to these women and to you and me is that uh, while unfortunately we may know these women uh, for their disagreement, um, that's really not their eternal legacy. Uh, the fact is that when it comes to eternity, when it comes to heaven, and we thought about heaven last week, these women, their names are in the book of life. And I, I even believe that this is a way of Paul encouraging these women when it came to their disagreement. Uh, just a fourth point under Paul's approach. Uh, what was Paul's conflict resolution style? Um, in uh, classical uh, conflict resolution theory, there seem to be four or five uh, styles of conflict resolution. Um, one of the approaches would be this idea of uh, a, a consultation, of a conciliatory approach where the two parties work towards a, a mutually uh, beneficial resolution. Uh, another approach is sometimes labeled competing. It's, it's actually a situation where maybe one of the parties who has authority, uh, who, who has that uh, responsibility in, in an urgent situation, um, determines the resolution by saying, well, I'm the boss, I'm in authority, it's going to be my way. I, I've only had a couple of times in church life where I've had to uh, uh, kind of uh, announce my uh, authority in a situation and say, I, I generally like your input and I love to be collaborative, that kind of first style, but um, that, that kind of consultation or collaboration in this situation, it needs to be uh, more of uh, my way has to prevail. A, th a third style is sometimes labeled um, uh, compromising. 
And, and we sometimes look at that word negatively, but there's often times with conflict resolution where we have to come to a middle ground. It does involve an element of give and take. And then a fourth style is sometimes called accommodating, where one of the parties gives in. Now, be careful with that. I have a warning with that, because sometimes it's not healthy to just give in. Uh, I, I've, I've had people say, oh, I, I never have conflict with another person. There's never disagreement. And part of me goes, well, maybe there should be. Because as I've said earlier, sometimes that disagreement can lead to debate that can actually lead to the best decision. The other warning I have is the person who is always accommodating, who is always giving in, sometimes we call them the doormat, um, often I've discovered in counseling there can be a lot of bitterness that builds up within that person. So be careful with that accommodating approach. Sometimes there may be a situation where you're going, no, I think it's the right thing for me just to give in. The, the fifth and final style would be called avoidance. And uh, unless it's a really minor disagreement that really doesn't matter at all, um, I, I think it's usually best that we avoid the avoidance style. Well, let me transition very quickly to what I call the the, the steps or the strategies. And this is where we want to be very practical. Uh, what does Paul suggest in a very practical way to these two women and the wider community? I think Paul's key piece of advice involves humility. It's where Paul says, I plead with both of you to be of the same mind in the Lord. This pushes us back to what we have already discovered in Philippians 2. Do you remember the words in Philippians 2 where Paul says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Here's the punch. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility. Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as that of Christ Jesus. And then you'll recall in chapter 2, verses 6 and 11, we have this wonderful example of the humility of our Lord Jesus Christ. I would argue strongly that the key to conflict resolution, especially in the church, is the practice of humility. As I said a couple of months ago, it's about harmony through humility. In a conflict situation, especially when you are in a sharp disagreement with that other person, practice, exercise humility. Be thinking about the concerns and the interests of the other person. And then another point under this final uh, stage or section. This is what I call the holding what we hold in common, that holding factor. Uh, we've talked a lot about people's differences. They're there. But Paul here focuses on, he stresses in verse 2 and 3, what it is they hold in common. Both these women were co-workers, participants, uh, partners in the gospel, contending by Paul's side. They, they were with him, partnering together and with Paul. And it was for the cause or the sake of the gospel. This is what really mattered. This was what was essential. And Paul is saying to these women, you may have your differences. There may be this dis disagreement you need to work out. But do it in, in this sense that you have so much. What matters most 
is what you hold in common. Well, finally, I want to pick up on this phrase where Paul asks the true companion. We don't know who this is. Uh, was it Lydia? Was it Luke? Both have been suggested as possibilities. But this would be someone who Paul could count on in the church at Philippi who would represent Paul well, who would hold his same concern and his same passion for conflict resolution. And here's what Paul says, uh, I want you to help these women. This whole idea of, of help. What would that have looked like? Would it have been a case of this person uh, being a facilitator, a mediator? Maybe this person offering some advice, ensuring that these two women got together to talk out their issue or problem. Uh, maybe someone who would give them counsel from Matthew 5 or Matthew 18, where we see Jesus setting forth some recommendations on conflict resolution. Nevertheless, this idea of another person who cares about both parties coming alongside and offering help. Just a pause to allow you <coughs> to uh, regroup a little bit under this idea of help. So years ago <coughs> was when I was in seminary, and uh, I was involved in a, a lot of preaching at the time. Um, while I was in seminary, speaking at a lot of youth retreats, youth camps, and that particular year, for whatever reason, I was speaking a lot on, on unity, uh, people getting along and uh, the importance of harmony um, in, 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 in Christian community. Um, that year, the seminary uh, selected two leaders. I was on the student council at the time, but they wanted to select two student leaders to attend the national uh, student Leadership Conference for seminary students that year held in Vancouver at the University of British Columbia in conjunction with uh, Regent College. I was selected a student leader because they saw me representing a more conservative theological perspective. That was fine. And then another fellow, we'll call him Addison, was selected because he was kind of an out-of-the-box thinker. He sure wouldn't be labeled uh, theologically conservative, but they thought it would be a good idea that both of us go to represent uh, our seminary. Well, that was fine. I didn't have a lot to do with Addison at school, but we went out there, and uh, it was a good conference, but one of my disappointments was uh, poor Addison and me, we didn't we didn't really see eye to eye. I went with the idea as a member of the student council that the uh, school was spending a lot of money to send us out to this conference, and uh, you didn't miss a session. You weren't to miss a seminar. You were to be a, a, a good participant. Addison had an, another agenda altogether. He missed sessions. Uh, okay, I shouldn't be saying this, but I think he regarded it kind of as a as a holiday, and we sure didn't see eye to eye on it. And I remember the trip back at the end of the conference was very uncomfortable. Um, the, we, we, had, we had experienced a falling out. And the first week or two back at the seminary, it was awkward between us. And I remember uh, someone calling for a debriefing session. And I think this person had something else in mind because it had become very obvious in the seminary that the two of us had had a falling out. Here's me going around telling all kinds of people about unity and maintaining unity and harmony uh, in, in, in Christian circles, but I appreciate that because we needed some help. I, 
I needed to hear Addison's point of view. He needed to hear mine. And no, we never became best friends, but I think we came to a, a healthy resolution of what could have been uh, could have been much worse consequences from that time. Let me just continue on this uh, idea of, of help. I, I often find it good to ask people the question, what do you not want to see as a resolution of this problem? Um, what, what's the worst case scenario? And, and, and be direct and firm about that. There's also three ground rules that I find helpful when it comes to uh, helping people with concrete ideas on resolution. Um, one of the first ideas is that the parties should work together. They should agree that uh, resolving the conflict is important. I know it's hard if one of the parties says, I, I have no interest in it, but usually, especially with Christ followers, you can appeal at, at that level. Let, let's work together. Let's, let's see the two of you uh, sort this out, to work this out to come to that point of resolution. Uh, the second uh, ground rule is respecting each other. Uh, there can be no room for insults or personal attacks. There's a lot of hurt feelings, but that idea of respecting each other is important. And then third and maybe most importantly is encourage the parties in a conflict to listen to each other well. Good listening. You remember I've said before that good listening involves not only uh, assimilating and absorbing what the other person is saying, but communicating back to them that you've tried to hear and understand what they're saying. That person's perspective on the conflict situation. We need to discourage problem listening behaviors like surface listening. You, you need to, as you hear from that other person involved in the conflict with you, you, you need to hear the, the feelings or maybe even the hurt behind the words they're saying. So, so don't just surface listen. The other thing we talk about is uh, associative listening. You know, really hear the person out. Before you jump in and say, well, if you think that you were hurt, let me tell you about how hurt I feel. No, you don't want that kind of associative hearing. You want to hear that person out and, and allow that person to share and, and, and that you're listening to them. Conditional listening is where you listen to a person up to a point and then you cut them off. I've often said, and I'll repeat again, that you don't need to uh, approve of what the person is saying. I'm not even saying you agree with that person's uh, interpretation of what has happened, but you accept it. You say, you know what, I'm going to hear you out. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be willing to accept everything you're telling me whether I agree with it or not. And then finally, and of course this is obvious, is interruption. You, you want to give that person a chance to tell his or her side of the story. My guess is all of this may have happened with these two women as the uh, true companion of Paul's helped them out, who offered his aid or her aid into their situation. Uh, as we're wrapping up, I, I came across this the other day, and uh, it comes from a pastor well-known in Ontario. I call him Pastor Carey from Barry, but he has uh, seven steps for conflict resolution. This will be very quick and shotgun style, but I think it'll affirm some of the things we've talked about today. Uh, step number one, own your part of the conflict. If there's a conflict, if there's a disagreement, you have a part in it if, if you're one of the parties. Uh, a related question, and I find this fascinating, is what is it like uh, to be on the other side of you? Think about that question. Put yourself in the shoes of 
the person you're in conflict with? And what is it like to be on the other side of you? A profound question. Step number two, <clears throat> go direct. Paul says, help the two women, but don't interpret that to mean interfere or meddle in their situation. I'm not a big fan of what we call triangling. Um, Matthew 5, Matthew 18, uh, the, the first step needs to be that these two people are dealing directly with each other. If it doesn't work out, it's then where there's other levels of intervention. Uh, the third step, which I think is so helpful, believe the best about the other person. Often in a conflict, we make that other person out to be a monster. They're just downright evil. Uh, we've been reminded today, as Paul approached this, to see the good in other people, see who they are, their identity in Christ. Uh, important that we see the best in them. Um, the fourth step, explain, don't blame. Um, I, I have a su practice I suggest, because I've dealt with couples in conflict, especially during marriage counseling. Uh, you try to eliminate the kind of phrases like, uh, you did this, you did that, you're to blame, you're like this, you're like that. But more of an emphasis on when you said this. When this happened, this is how I felt. Um, a, a, a person can become defensive when you're saying you are this or you are that. When you say, I felt this, I felt like that, it, it actually uh, shifts it to a very uh, productive focus. Uh, step number five, be specific. Uh, as you are able to uh, be specific about uh, what has happened, uh, number six, uh, which I think is great, tell them you want the situation to be better. Uh, I think this is uh, something that we should all put into practice. And then finally, uh, pray. Uh, a great reminder that in any hard, difficult situation, especially between people, we can pray and ask for God's peace couple of bonus things just at the end under this banner of help. Um, conflict resolution takes time. And some of you know that. Some of you may be in the middle of a disagreement with a family member, uh, someone at work, or in this case, a, a, a church member. And uh, I know it takes time. But be patient and allow God to do his wonderful work of, of reconciliation. Uh, second thing I would say is uh, grace and forgiveness. We haven't really drawn on these two wonderful blessings to us, but as Christians, we have these resources that can help us very much when it comes to conflict resolution, grace and forgiveness. And then I'm going to say this. I, I think it de does need to be said. And you may be saying, John, you really haven't defined, um, you know, this idea of uh, resolution. Uh, what does resolution look like? Uh, is it restoration? Is it reconciliation? It, it depends. I mean, there are situations where you may say, we're, we're just going to agree to disagree. We're going to ask that we come up with the, the most Christ-honoring solution. We, never, we may never be best friends. We may never be truly that close again. But we do believe that with God's help and by his grace, we can maintain unity. It is so important and fundamental, not only between the two parties involved, but these kind of issues do impact the greater community. My final, final comment. We're going to be looking at a pas passage next week, Philippians 4, 4 to 9, that's often looked at kind of in an isolated way, and I've heard some great sermons that look at Philippians 4, 4 to 9 in this way, but I wonder... 
could there be a link between what Paul has addressed in Philippians 4, 1 to 3, and his teaching in Philippians 4, 4 to 9? Tune in next week to find out. May God help us as we navigate our way through conflicts, disruptions, disagreement. May we always have a passion for Christ-honoring conflict resolution. Amen. Well, Pastor John made reference to the horrific attack that took place last Sunday. And we're deeply saddened, we're heartbroken, we're shocked. This isn't right. We need to love one another. If you missed the vigil that took place, you can catch a replay of it on the London Mosque Facebook page. It was also filmed by Rogers TV, so it'll be available on Rogers TV. And I would encourage you to follow the London Mosque, their Facebook pages, and their website, as there will be more information about upcoming events and some tangible ways that we can participate and to show our love for one another and to show our support. And certainly, it's appropriate if we take time together and pray. So I would encourage you to bow your heads and pray with me. Lord, Papa, the God of Abraham, Abraham who was the father of Isaac and Ishmael, Lord, you are the God of peace. And in the wake of this attack, we turn to you. For our fellow Londoners who are shaken, heartbroken, angry, scared, Lord, we ask that your peace would be upon them. Father, we lift the Muslim community to you, Lord. We ask that your spirit would guide us Show us how to be better neighbors. Show us how to take real action. Papa, be with young Fayez, who's just nine years old. And at nine, he has to face things that most of us could never even imagine. We pray for a quick and complete healing for Fayez, physically and spiritually. Lord, may he feel your presence. God of peace, God of peace, may he feel the support from the community. We think of his extended family that will now guide him and raise him. We pray for an extra portion of strength and for wisdom for them. God of peace, may your peace be upon London. Amen. Well, there's no real easy way to transition into our announcement segment today, but there's a couple of a big announcements that we need to share with you. One of them is standing to my right. It is my pleasure to reintroduce you to Allison, our summer intern, who was our summer intern last summer, did such a fabulous job that she's come back again for more. Allison, we are so excited to have you back at Byron Community Church. And I'm so excited to be here. We have some really, really exciting opportunities coming up this summer. First off, we have our experiment bags. We're going to be doing a round of experiment rent bags in July and in August so you can follow along on our YouTube and our website for that. We also have this month a really really fun and exciting opportunity. We have a tea party coming up with a very very special guest. Let's hear from that special guest right now. Hello everyone my name is Snow White and I am so excited to be here today to cordially invite you to my very own tea party. We're going to have so much fun singing and dancing and telling stories. Make sure to wear your best princely and princess attire and have lots of fun when we see you there. <laughs> That's right, Snow White is going to be joining us virtually here for a royal tea party, and all of you boys and girls are invited to attend that Saturday, June 26th, live at 10 a.m. What's great about these events, Allison, is that you can tune in live at 10 a.m., or you can wait and watch it on demand afterwards. So if you want to wait for a rainy day and decide that you want to have a tea party a little bit later on, you can do that. We know we're going to have a lot of fun with Snow White, and Allison's got some fun, exciting crafts and other things planned for us. We can't wait to see you there. Bye for now. <laughs>